All right, this is going to be the final lecture for the summer work for AP Biology. For this lecture, there's going to be a bit of background information that you probably don't really need to know specifically, and then we'll kind of get into the meat of some of the things that you do know, and I'll make sure that I point that out when we get there. So this is all about carbon as the base for all biological molecules, which then, of course, build into organelles, into cells, into organs, etc. And this is going to be critical for understanding the one main theme that goes throughout everything in chemistry and in biology, and that is that structure determines function down to the tiniest detail in the structure of a molecule. Okay, so when we start looking at the atomic structure of carbon, we see that it has six protons, meaning six electrons. This is going to give us four valence electrons, so our Lewis structure is going to look like this. And this allows carbon to bond four times in single, double, and triple bonds, allowing it to make all kinds of different molecular structures, chains, rings, and a variety of compounds, which can then build to make very large molecules like DNA, starch, and lots of different proteins. Anything that has carbon and hydrogen in it is going to be called an organic molecule. This is a whole branch of chemistry that is called organic chemistry. And this is very different from organic farming or organic food, which emphasizes very natural things, um, nothing um, false or um, synthetic. Organic chemistry, on the other hand, is anything with carbon and hydrogen, which includes harmful pesticides, plastics, gasoline, um, a lot of the different things that organic and environmental people don't like. So very different. When we start looking at the way carbon builds, our simplest organic molecule is going to be natural gas, which is methane. Add another carbon, you get ethane, and then you start changing the bonds, and this is going to give you ethene. And the naming of a structure is going to be based on the number of carbons, the types of bonds that are in it, and the structures that are attached to it. And then you can go have three carbons, which is propane, four is butane, five is pentane. It goes on and on. There's a whole system of nomenclature around organic chemistry. All of those nomenclature processes are there to emphasize what the molecule looks like so that chemists and scientists know what the structure is. Basic things that carbon will bond to, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and itself. It can bond singly to all of those, double bonds to anything but hydrogen, and then triple bonds to carbon and nitrogen. Carbon is never going to bond in a quadruple bond because that fourth orbital would be pointed in the opposite direction, <clears throat> preventing it from forming a bond. Carbon and hydrogen, nonpolar, that's going to be important for when we talk about fats and oils. Carbon and oxygen, <clears throat> it's going to be polar, just like oxygen and hydrogen. And then carbon and nitrogen, slightly polar. Again, those interactive forces are going to allow molecules to bind together, causing lots of different properties. As we start looking at the way the molecules build, so as I said before, um, going and adding carbons. It's going to change the name and what it does. It changes the chemical properties, the boiling points, the melting points, how much energy can be extracted from them. And here we go from propane to butane. <clears throat> this is four carbons, but here we've also got four carbons, but they are arranged in a different way. So it has a different name. So two methylpropane. So this you don't know at all, but it's just fun. Um, your base name is propane, just like up here, but then you've got a methyl group, a single carbon coming off of it. And when you look at that, 
all of these things. You can then name where that methyl group is coming off that second carbon. So that's why it's two methyl, because that's the side chain. And then three carbons is your base name, which is propane. <clears throat> but because of that little side branch, that is different from here. So it is going to have different chemical properties. Double bonds, you can see there's a double bond here after the first carbon or here after the second carbon. So they have different names. And that is important because, again, that tiny little structure, that tiny little difference is going to affect how that molecule reacts and therefore what the final structure of the product of that chemical reaction is. When we start looking at the way carbon bonds together and forms different compounds, you get different types of isomers. So if we go back to basic chemistry, you've got isotopes. That is the same element, but different numbers of neutrons. So an isomer is going to be the same chemical formula, but just put together in a different way. So what we see here, this is four carbons and 10 hydrogens. This is, I'm sorry, that's not four carbons, that is five carbons. And then this is also five carbons and they both have 12 hydrogens. So they are both C5H12 the so same chemical formula, but put together in a different way. So those are isomers. <laughs> These are called structural isomers simply because they are just rearranged in a different way. <clears throat> this next pair, these are called geometric isomers because they are going to be oriented differently around the double bond. So when you have a double bond like this, the double bond restricts the movement of molecules so they can't rotate. So that means that it locks these groups into specific positions and you can have where they are across from each other that is called trans and then you have where they are on the same side of the double bond and that is called cis. Why is that important? So if this is a hormone <clears throat> um, it might have to be where these two active groups or these two functional groups are on the same side in order for it to bond to a cell to trigger a cellular response. This is the same chemical formula, but because those two groups are not on the same side, this may not be able to bond to the cell and cause um, a specific response that the cell needs to do something to stay alive. Another type of isomer are enantiomers, and enantiomers are interesting because they are actually same chemical formula, and they look like they're put together in the same way, but they're actually mirror images of each other, just like your hands are. Um, and so you, if your hands are not identical, you cannot overlay them, and they do the same thing. And that's actually specifically important Sorry, drop my pen. That's what you want to see is my bald head. Um, that's specifically important because there are so many compounds and molecules that have these mirror images, and some of them are biologically active and some of them are not. And I'll talk about those in a second. Um, actually, I'll talk about them now. So in the pharmacy, so in these two cases right here, we've got L-DOPA and we've got D-DOPA. That's how we um, differentiate the different kinds of enantiomers. So this one is going to be effective against Parkinson's disease. So that is a neurological disease that causes shaking. Uh, whereas this one does nothing. They have the exact same chemical composition except for the way they're put together. And antiomers are very common in medicines. So there is the active form of ibuprofen, and then there's the inactive form, which is its mirror image. Glucose, which is a very common sugar, D-glucose, you can taste, L-glucose, you cannot, even though they have the exact same chemical composition. This is significantly important because what these molecules do can affect cells. And they think that a lot of the side effects that medications have are due to the enantiomers. 
there is a famous drug called thalidomide. that was prescribed in the 60s to pregnant women to help prevent morning sickness. And it did. It would keep them from being nauseous in the morning. But the enantiomer of the thalidomide caused horrible birth defects in the children. They'd be born without limbs, um, maybe all four limbs, or maybe just one leg or an arm or a hand. And it was because of the enantiomer. And what they found later, once they pulled this from the market, is that the enantiomer, the one that causes the birth defects, is actually very good at treating leprosy. So one enantiomer treats morning sickness, the other one treats leprosy. But the problem with enantiomers, they have the same boiling point, they have the same melting point, so it is extremely difficult to separate them chemically to give you a pure form of one versus the other. And even if they are able to do that with thalidomide, thalidomide will naturally reach an equilibrium in the body of the two different enantiomers. So you're still gonna get those um, birth effects um, trying to treat the morning sickness. So what is all that? Why is all that important? It's about structure, it's about function, and so the structure of that molecule determines what it does inside of the cell. All right, things that affect the structure of a carbon chain are going to be things called functional groups. These are simply different chemical groups that attach to the carbon chains, changing how they react, their boiling point, their melting point, changing their polarity, all these different things, how they react and what they can do. So the different types of functional groups, the first group is the hydroxyl. So if you've got ethane, which is two carbons, if you add an OH, that becomes ethanol. That is what is in hand sanitizer. That's what drinking alcohol is. And ethane is a gas. This is a liquid because if we don't have the OH, then we've got a nonpolar compound, so it doesn't attract to itself, so it's a gas. But if you add an OH, that makes the molecule polar, therefore it starts to stick to itself and it becomes a liquid at room temperature. These are also critical in sugars. So there's lots of hydroxyl groups on sugar molecules. We will look at those when we do our macromolecule lecture. The next functional group is something known as a carbonyl, which is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. So you can have two basic types of carbonyls. You can have where the carbonyl is on the end, like that. That is called an aldehyde. Or you can have where the carbonyl is in the middle, and that is known as a ketone. And I always remember ketones is in the middle because the oxygen or the O in ketone is in the middle of the word. Why are aldehydes important? These affect how um, sugars form ring structures, and then that gives them their shape, which then determines their chemical structure. Again, we'll look at that when we talk about our macromolecules. Carboxyls are combinations of carbonyls and hydroxyls. So here is your hydroxyl, here is your carbonyl, and now you have a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acids, um, very important for um, the food industry. A lot of these are flavoring compounds that give things tart flavors um, in your candies and in drinks and all those kind of stuff. And they are also components of sugars and parts of um, amino acids. In amino acid, we see a central carbon bonded to a nitrogen. That nitrogen has two hydrogens on it. That is the amino group. And then you've got the carboxylic acid part. So, and then you've got a hydrogen and then you have this thing called an R group, which varies from amino acid to amino acid. So 
amino group, carboxylic acid, and then those are going to then form long chains of proteins, which basically run everything inside of our cells without we would be not alive. Sulf hydro groups, real easy, sulf, sulfur, hydro, hydrogen, and these are going to be important in proteins. They are part of uh, amino acids, and if you've got two sulf hydro groups, they may bond together, which makes what is known as a disulfide bridge. So if this is one amino acid, this is another amino acid, the sulfur here and the sulfur here, they will bind. That's a disulfide bridge. If you have curly hair, that's because you have lots of disulfide bridges in the keratin that makes up your hair and that makes it curly. Phosphates are critically important because these are part of DNA and RNA as the sides of <laughs> the structures. And then ATP is adenosine triphosphate, and that is going to be the group that gives energy to everything that our cells do. So those are very, very, very important. Methyl groups. So if you have DNA, methyl groups can bind to certain parts of the DNA, typically um, the cytosine. And that will actually cause the DNA to shut down and it will block gene expression. So this is one of the ways that our bodies regulate what genes in our cells are expressed. So all of our cells have the same DNA, but not all of our cells look alike because our cells are expressing different uh, genes <clears throat> from one cell type to the next. And one of the ways that we shut down gene expression is by the methylation of the non-active genes. So why are these functional groups important? <clears throat> Structure determines function again. So if we're gonna look at two hormones, estradiol or estrogen and testosterone, so we can see that you've got these carbon rings, each of these little angles right here that represents a carbon. So think about it like this. And so instead of drawing those organic chemists like to take a shortcut and they just the angle represents a carbon <laughs> so these are all carbon chains and what's going to happen in these you can see that we've got a methyl group we've got a hydroxyl um, and then down here we've got an, an additional methyl group on the testosterone and we've got a hydroxyl versus a carbonyl right there <clears throat> that's the difference between a male and a female lion right there that's going to be the difference between an embryo developing from a female into a male so we all start out as females we all start developing as females and then um, males have the y chromosome and on the y chromosome there is something known as the s r y gene it's not the sorry gene, meaning that males have to apologize to women all the time. Uh, this is the gene that makes cells receptive to testosterone. And then that's what causes them to then develop as males. So the reason that um, men have nipples <clears throat> is because the SRY gene does not become active until after the nipple tissue has developed. So um, that's why we have those. But the difference, going back to it, is these functional groups on the same base molecule are slightly different. Those two tiny changes cause very large macroscopic differences in males and females. All right, so we've got a bunch of um, carbon molecules. We can start putting them together. <clears throat> so if we have one part, that's a monomer, and if they bond two together, that's called a dimer. Oligomers are three to ten parts, and then you have a polymer. So if you've got one, that's a monomer, then you have a dimer, and then you have an oligomer, and then you keep building, 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 etc., <clears throat> and then you'd have a polymer. This is how you go from something like glucose to starch, 
or a DNA nucleotide to a DNA molecule from an amino acid to a protein. And this is all how we build our macromolecules, which then are made into cells, into tissues, into organs, etc. Now the polymerization reaction is called dehydration synthesis or the condensation reaction. So here we have a molecule and we've got a hydroxyl group right here, the oxygen and the hydrogen. And we've got another one right here. And what happens in the condensation reaction is the hydroxyl group from one is removed the hydrogen from another is removed, and those are put together. <clears throat> so now we have a dimer of those two molecules linking. What happens with the hydroxyl and the hydrogen that are removed, they are bonded together, and now you have H2O. So that is why it is called dehydration synthesis, because it removes a water <clears throat> from those two molecules or a condensation reaction. Condensation is the formation of water out of the air. Um, we could do this as a drawing. So you have a monomer with a hydroxyl, another monomer with a hydroxyl. And what is going to happen is this gets removed to make your water and then your product is your dimer. And because we have removed water, that is dehydration, and we have formed something, that is synthesis. All of these reactions are happening all the time in our body. They all require energy. They all require a catalyst, which is gonna be some enzyme that does the work and controls the reaction in order for that molecule to form. <clears throat> in this case, what we see is we have one hydroxyl and one hydrogen. So that would be this case where here's our hydroxyl, here is our um, hydrogen. And so my <clears throat> hydroxyl gets removed, my hydrogen gets removed, we make our water, that's our dehydration. And then and this combines together and we've got our synthesis of that molecule there. So it doesn't have to be two hydroxyls. It can be a hydroxyl and a hydrogen. <clears throat> if it's two hydroxyls, what will we be, there will be an oxygen in between there instead of um, whatever was attached to that hydrogen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now the opposite of that is breaking a monomer off or breaking a polymer down. So we've got our dimer and say this is um, a disaccharide. So say this is sucrose, which is made up of a glucose and a fructose. Our body's gonna digest that because sucrose is too big for our cells to absorb. So what our cells do, the enzyme sucrase is going to break this but those are unbonded orbitals, that's not good. So the enzyme takes a water and it is going to bond the hydroxyl to one and we are going to bond the hydrogen to the other and we're back to what we started with. So it's just the opposite of dehydration synthesis. So hydrolysis, <clears throat> that literally means water splitting. So we are splitting this molecule apart by taking this water, breaking the water, lysing the water, splitting it, and now you have part that is digested off. So this, is, we, this would be how your body digests starch. <clears throat> starch is a long chain of glucose molecules so the enzyme amylase starts cutting off one, cuts off another, cuts off another, cuts off another, releasing glucose for your body to absorb. Again, takes an enzyme, again, takes energy, <clears throat> but it's breaking that apart. So these two types of reactions, hydrolysis 
and dehydration synthesis can be classified as two basic types of metabolism, anabolic metabolism and catabolic metabolism. Anabolic metabolism is where the cells are building something like anabolic steroids are taken by bodybuilders to build muscle. And then catabolic metabolism is where things are broken down. Both of these types of metabolisms require energy for the reactions to start. But after an anabolic reaction, the energy is going to be stored. And a catabolic reaction is going to release this energy. Examples of this anabolic reactions include things like protein synthesis, photosynthesis, Notice the synthesis on both of those things. Synthesis means to build. And then catabolic would be digestion of large food molecules like starch and proteins. So the whole reason that we need to eat proteins in our diet as we eat them, our digestive system is going to break those long, complex proteins down into those individual monomers. Then our digestive system is going to take those monomers and absorb them into our circulatory system, our blood, and then our circulatory system distributes those amino acids through our body. They are absorbed by our cells. And then our cells take those monomers and rebuilds them back into the proteins that our body needs. So that is like the alphabet. So we've Instead of 26 letters, our amino acids of our proteins, there's only 20 of those. So we rearrange those 20 amino acids into long different proteins to do different jobs. And the order of those amino acids, just like the order of the letters and words, gives them different meanings. And the meaning of a protein is the job that it does. So the order of those amino acids, the order of those monomers, determines its structure. And then the structure of that protein determines what it does. So I've talked about several different enzymes. I talked about sucrase. That breaks down the sugar sucrose. I talked about amylase. That breaks down starch. They don't do anybody else's job. They just do theirs because their structure specifically determines what they can do. If you change that structure, it can't do its job anymore. That's what happens with a mutation. That's why mutations are typically so damaging and deadly because this tiniest little difference can cause an enzyme to lose all of its functionality. And if that's a critical enzyme in the cell, then that cell is most likely going to die. So everything in this goes back to tiny different structural complexities, which then when you magnify those out, have large impact on the organism.